Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Retina Round. I am Dr. Manali Singhal, fellow in Vitro Retina and Ocular Oncology and I shall take you through this month's top 5 articles. Let's start with the first article that is to evaluate the efficacy and safety of intravitreal trimsinolone acetonide when used early at the end of emergency surgery for open globe injury to inhibit proliferated vitro retinopathy. This is a prospective randomized controlled clinical trial in which total of 68 globe rupture patients with zone 3 were included. The patients were randomized to the control group or the trimsolone acetonide group in 1 is to 1 allocation ratio. Patients were injected with 0.1 ml of trimsolone in the trimsolone group and 0.1 ml balanced salt solution in the control group at the end of the emergency surgery. The primary and secondary outcomes were decided, with primary outcome being assessment of traumatic proliferative vitreoretinopathy during vitrectomy 10 plus minus 3 days later, while the secondary outcomes included visual equity, retina attachment rate, macular attachment rate, proliferative vitreoretinopathy recurrent rate, side effects 6 months after vitrectomy. In the study, author found that during vitrectomy, the traumatic proliferative vitreoretinopathy grade of the control group was significantly more severe than the trimsolone group. The TPVR score was significantly better and the fine visual equity seems to be significantly improved in the trimsolone group than in the control group. The retinal attachment rates were 88% and 63.64% in the trimsolone acetonide and the control group respectively. The authors found no significant difference in macular repositioning and PVR recurrent rate. Temporary intraocular pressure elevation occurred in one eye in the trimsolone acetonide group after emergency surgery. So the conclusion is that the early intravitreal trimsolone injection for open globe injury effectively reduces traumatic proliferative vitreoretinopathy, increases surgical success and improves visual prognosis. The second article discusses a technique of direct PFCL silicone oil exchange in cases where PFCL is used to flatten the unsupported detached retina, like in cases of giant retinal tears or relaxing retinectomies. They employ 20 gauge drainage cannula, avoiding intraoperative high intraocular pressure using Poisson's equation for laminar fluid flow through a cannula. Of the 26 patients enrolled in the study, they noted no intraoperative retinal slippage or pressure related complications. Post operatively, 20 patients underwent silicon oil removal, of which 6 developed re detachment and 14 remain attached with post operative vision ranging from 6 by 6 to hand movements, thus proving it to be a reliable and safe technique. Third study evaluated the safety and anatomical and functional results of intravitreal chopping of drop nucleus using a nitinol intraocular foreign body forceps as an alternative to manage retained nucleus fragments. Nine patients were enrolled in this study and these patients were followed up for one year. It was noted that the mean best corrected visual equity increased significantly in the post-operative follow-up and no complications related to the cataract surgery or drop nucleus removal were noted, thus proving it to be a safe and effective method, avoiding ultrasound energy and enabling 23-gauge vitrectomy without a fragment tone. Our fourth article assesses the feasibility of using ultrasound biomicroscopy while performing pars plana vitrectomy in patients with infectious keratitis and ophthalmitis. Ultrasound was used to witness the vitreous movements and to note the position of cutter in relation to the retinal wall. Probe was placed in four longitudinal positions, 3, 6, 9, and 12 o'clock. The 12 poor patients involved in this study were followed up for three months, and the visual equity and presence of adverse effects were assessed. 66 patients achieved resolution of endophthalmitis. Four patients showed adverse events, two had RD, and two had to undergo evisceration due to uncontrolled infection. Visual equity was 2.1 plus minus 0.3 log mark, thus concluding that ultrasound guided vitrectomy is feasible, but also more studies are needed to assess the safety profile and optimize outcomes. 
Finally, the last article studied the vitreous humor proteomic profile using liquid chromatography with tender mass spectrometry in 10 patients with vitreo retinal lymphoma and 10 control patients with idiopathic epiretinal membrane or macular hole and 10 patients with ocular sarcoidosis. This aimed at understanding the pathophysiology of vitreo retinal lymphoma. Differentially expressed proteins, that is DEPs, were identified by comparing VRL with controls. Then DEPs, which were upregulated in proteomics study, was then measured by ELISA. 1954 proteins were identified in all three groups. 282 DEPs were detected in VRL, out of which 249 were upregulated and on enrichment pathway analysis, 14 showed significant upregulation. ELISA confirmed significantly higher concentration of PS81, YWHAG, and 20S slash 26S proteasome complex in VRL as compared to controls. Thus, these identified DEPs will help provide insights in understanding VRL pathophysiology and help in development of VRL biomarkers. Thank you.